I am Carl Ross of the University of Portsmouth in the United Kingdom. And today I'm going to talk thinking of His Majesty's troop ship Lancastria. The early history of the Tyrrhenia, or Lancastria as she later became known, Britain suffered heavy losses in shipping during the First World War. Cunard alone lost 22 ships. As a result of this, the government subsidized a large shipbuilding program. Lancaster's original name was Tyrrhenia. The SS Tyrrhenia was built by William Beardsmore and, Co and Company, Dalmere, Glasgow. A keel was laid on June 2, 1919. She was built with geared turbine technology. The liner was due to be launched by Lady Inverness, Beardsmore's wife, on the 18th of May, 1920. However, the launch was cancelled because of gale force winds. She was eventually launched by Colonel J. Smith Park on the 31st of May, 1920. This was regarded, this, the fact that the Tyrrhenian's launch was postponed was regarded by sailors as a bad omen. The Tyrrhenian cost bills more £1,220,908. The contractual price was one million three hundred fifty nine thousand nine hundred seven pounds. Thus, Beer's bomb made a handsome profit of one hundred thirty eight thousand nine hundred ninety nine pounds. Her sister ship was Cameronia and the Transylvania. For the next two years, the Tyrrhenia was fitted out. A plate alone weighed sixty tons. A gross weight was 16,243 tons, and the registered length of the width were 552.8 feet, that's 170 meters, and 70.4 feet, which is 21.6 meters, respectively. A draft was 29 feet, which was 8.8 .8 meters, and this was 23,500 tons, while a dead weight was 11,200 tons. She was fitted for oil fuel. She was propelled by Brown Curtis steam turbines. She was driven by two propellers, which developed a total of 12,500 shaft horsepower. The maximum speed was 17 knots. Her fuel capacity was 1,380 tons. There's the plans of the Tyrrhenia. The issue there. Fine vessel. And here's some more plans. These are plans of some of the decks. And yet some more plans of some of the lower decks. The Tyrrhenia and her sister ship, the Cameronia, were used on the transatlantic passage during the 1920s. On 27th February 1924, the Tyrrhenia was renamed the Lancasteria. Sailors regarded this as a bad omen. On 22nd March 1924, the Lancaster began a maiden voyage from Liverpool to New York. There is His Majesty's troop ship, the Lancasteria fine vessel. This is a tram passing the Tyrrhenia. You can see how huge the Tyrrhenia is compared with that tram. And here's another picture of His Majesty's troop ship Lancastria in peacetime. This is the dining room on the Lancastria. You can see what a splendid room it is. This is the Veranda Cafe, another splendid room. This is the gents' smoking room. In those days, the gents used to have their own smoking room in most of these ships, and uh, even in certain pubs, they had their own smoking room in those days. The Wall Street crash. On 24th October 1929, the Wall Street crash occurred. This caused the USA's economy to go to into recession. Trade on the scheduled transatlantic routes gradually diminished. 
This course is keen after switch to long periods of cruising during the bleak years. In 1933, Cunard merged with White Star. Lancaster made many crews, including some to the Mediterranean. In 1938, the cost of a 13-day Mediterranean cruise started at 13 guineas, which is 13 pounds, 65 pence, and the cost of a 22-day cruise started at 23 guineas, which is 24 pounds, 15 pence. 39, however, the Second World War started. I am speaking to you from the Cabinet Room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British Ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. Very sad speech. The war years. The start of the Second World War was to affect the city of Lancaster. Britain and France declared war on Germany on the 3rd of September 1939. On the 5th of October 1939, she was requisitioned by the Ministry of Defence as a troop ship. She was printed in grey and her portholes were blacked out. In January 1940, she sailed from Liverpool to Halifax, Canada. Her journey had two purposes. Westbound, she carried Canadian civilians, and eastbound, she carried war materials, including cased aircraft. Germany won many of the early bat war battles, and in 1940, Britain started to withdraw her troops from Europe. Germany invaded Denmark and Norway on the 9th of April, 1940. Thus, on the 1st of May, 1940, the Lancaster was involved in a Narvik bound troop convoy carrying expeditionary forces to Norway. She was also involved in supplying troops and provisions from Glasgow to Reykjavik, Iceland. The code name of the convoy was known as Alabasta. In May 1940, the German troops had pushed well into France. The British decided to withdraw their personnel from France back into Britain, thus the Lancaster was summoned for Dunkirk duties. Dunkirk, of course, was in Belgium. The 27th May 1940, the miraculous rescue of 338,226 men and women from the Dunkirk beaches commenced. This really was a miracle, and the British only expected a rescue by 25,000 people. Thus, it was over 10 times the number of people that actually British rescued from from, uh, the Dun from Dunkirk area. And there you see the Maginot Line. The Maginot Line, you see that you could see it on there. That's to the right of the drawing. It went right around the British built, the British to front built forces there to hold back the Germans. But the Germans penetrated from the north. See the break in the line there? They penetrated to the north and thrust downwards into uh, Belgium and France. There you can see the fortress on the Maginot Line formidable thing, but it didn't work, because the Germans just went round it and came down from the top, down from Belgium, and they thrust down there, and they pushed. This is the fortress of the Maginot Line, you can see how formidable it was. Most of the British expeditionary forces were safely evacuated, and the French forces surrendered north of the River Somme. The Germans pushed south, and on 5th June 1940, they breached the Maginot Line. The large force of Cherbourg, Brest, and saint Lazare were threatened. Operation Cycle was the code name for the evacuation of men from ports along the northwest coast of France, including the port of Le Havre. The port of Dieppe was deliberately blocked by the Allies. Operation Ariel was the code name for the evacuation of the British forces from the ports of Cherbourg, San Malo, Brest, Saint-Nazaire, and La Paris. 
Her Majesty, His Majesty's troops should like Austria sail for Saint Lazare. On the morning of the 16th June 1940, the evacuation of the remaining British troops began using two British liners, namely the Georgic and the Duchess of York, and also using two Polish liners, namely the Battery and the Sober Sobieski from Kiberon Bay 28. The Luftwaffe attacked shipping in Kiberon Bay, but fortunately they managed to slightly damage the liner Franconia. The Lancaster arrived in darkness at 6 in the morning on the 17th of June 1940 near Saint Nazar. She anchored at approximately 12 fathoms at 72 feet or 22 meters of water at the lowest tide. She was informed by a naval transport officer that she was to take as many troops as possible without regard to international law limits. All morning the sky throbbed with the distant sounds of enemy aircraft. From 8 in the morning, smaller ships transported personnel from Saint Nazar to the Lancastria, including a small number of civilian men, women and children. On the morning of the 17th June 1940, the 10th French Army was in full retreat towards Duval and Rennes. The next slide shows some of the troops making for HMT Lancastria. There were mainly British soldiers, but also included Royal Air Force personnel. One slide shows a map of Kiberon Bay. There you can see the evacuating troops from Sat Nazar. In an orderly manner, they're trying to get out of the country and get back to Britain. And there you see troops in the full deck of HMS Highlander. And here they was hired on the way back to Lancaster, embarking. And there's a map of Kiberon Bay. This is where the Lancaster was sunk. At 15.43 on the 17th of June, 1940, the Air Raid Patrol, ARP, alarm was sounded. The Lancaster was under attack from some German Ju-88 bombers. The Ju-88 bombers were diving from 200 to 300 feet, which is 61 to 91 meters above. The next slide shows the Ju-88 bomber in a steep dive dropping its bombs. There you can see the Ju-88 bomber attacking. A couple of bombs just missed the Lancaster where they fell to port, but this awoke those who were sleeping. Eyewitnesses accounts buried somewhat, but it was confirmed that four bombs hit their target in the vicinity of numbers two to four holes. Some survivors said that a bomb had gone down the funnel, but others did not agree with this account. The next sh slide showed the Lancaster on fire. There's the Lancaster on fire. And that's another view of the Lancaster on fire. Many Royal Air Force personnel were at number two hold. They suffered very heavy casualties. The bomb hitting number three hold must have released about 500 tons of fuel oil. A signalman tried to contact the engine room, but there was no reply. There were clouds of choking smoke everywhere. The scene and atmosphere were terrible. There were great acts of bravery. An army officer propped up his face with propped up with his face burnt and covered the dust muttered, How's my boys? Another army officer who had a life jacket offered it to two of his men who were without life jackets. They politely refused. But a third soldier who arrived on the scene accepted the officer's life saving offer. Captain Sharp rushed from his cabin to the wheelhouse, second before the chief officer, namely Gradage. Gradage grabbed the megaphone and shouted, Clear away the boats, please. Your attention, please. Clear away the boats. The next slide shows the capsizing of the Lancaster Air. There she is capsized, and you can see troops are climbing onto the, underneath the hull 
trying to save their lives because uh, it, it sank so quickly they didn't have time to to uh, get life. So many of them didn't have enough life, life jackets. They were grossly overcrowded, of course. There weren't enough life jackets. There weren't enough boats. Life boats to save them. The sea was covered in fuel oil or rather sinking like astray. The density of medium fuel oil is less than that of seawater, but its viscosity is about 500 times greater than that of seawater at 20 degrees C. Its viscosity is enormous. Thus, it is very difficult to swim. And seawater, which is covered with fuel oil, which has 500 times greater viscosity than that of seawater. Additionally, fuel oil is poisonous when swallowed, and swimming under the conditions that prevailed at the time and that some of the survivors had swallowed fuel oil. One army officer in the sea who had a life jacket took it off and handed it to one of his men who was swimming without a life, life jacket. It is not known whether the officer survived. A Bren gunner remained on board, firing his gun at the encircling German fighter planes above. We were trying to kill the British survivors and sea blow by strapping them. The Bren gunner did not leave his post until the waves from the sea washed him overboard. No one knew his identity, nor whether or not he survived. Three soldiers, each with life jackets, joined hands together in the sea so they floated in reasonable safety. They allowed three other soldiers who had no life jackets to join hands with them so that all six soldiers were buoyant. They all survived. One lifeboat was full and well over capacity, and a soldier tried to join the lifeboat, but an officer would not allow him on board and order him away. The soldier would not obey orders, so the officer shot him dead. Later, someone shot the off standing officer dead, and his body tumbled overboard. However, others said that the officer had shot himself to make way for, more, for one more survivor. A young French woman with a small baby called out for help. She threw her baby into the sea and dived into the water. To her great relief, a soldier had seen her do that and retrieved the baby and returned it to the distraught mother. Both mother and baby survived. One soldier who had not got a life had said, I cannot swim. An officer said, now's the time to learn. The soldier who was very fit dived into the sea and swam like an Olympian to a lifeboat. He survived. Ships and boats that came to the rescue include the Highlander, the Havelock, and the Trollers, the Agati, the Cambridgeshire, and the Paul Le Firm. A soldier called Jim Mansfield had slid down a convenient rope which was secured to the deck above, only to find that it did not reach the water. He dropped the remaining distance and remembered to hold his life jacket down as he plunged into the water. Many who were wearing life jackets forgot to hold their life jackets down as they fell into the water. Unfortunately, these poor unfortunates broke their necks by not carrying out the simple act and lost their lives. When the Titanic sang, sank, when the Titanic sank, they sang, Abide with me. But in the case of the singing of the Lancaster, they sang defiant songs such as, Roll out the barrel, and rule Britannia. Some sang until the sea took them. It was defined to the bitter end. Tony Payne, Royal Air Force, who had no life jacket, was suffering from cold and cramp, and was at the point of giving up when a folded wooden chair floated his way. He grabbed the chair and gave him some buoyancy. He survived. Many of the survivors were in very poor condition, and because the rescue ships were grossly overcrowded, some were thrown back in the sea to make way for others with a better chance of survival. The next few slides show pictures of some of the survivors. Here's an artist's view of the rescue. The Titanic, the Lancaster, um, overturned and sinking, and uh, some of the crew in a lifeboat. Here's a survivor. He looks cheerful. Here's about the survivors. One guy's got a smoke a cigarette in his mouth. Here's some other survivors. I knew the rescue from HMS Cambridgeshire to the John Holt. Rescue from HMS Cambridgeshire to the John Holt again. The, phot the photographer took the pictures of the sinking Lancaster with a sailor from the Highlander, who had early run out of film. 
Fortunately, he swapped his rum ration for a roll of film. The photography was not allowed during the war without special permission, but it's just as well that the city disobeyed orders. After the war, he gave away the film, free of charge to an acquaintance in a British pub. The acquaintance sold the film. So Winston Churchill carried out an injunction on the British press to prevent them from reporting on the loss of the Lancaster for a hundred years. So the British press will not publish the sinking of the Lancaster air until about 2040. He did this because the morale of the country was low and he wanted to turn a retreat into a victory. He raised the morale of the country with his speech and his statement that this is our finest hour. In retrospect, in retrospect, it was probably modern Britain's worst hour, but Churchill did raise the morale of the British people. The USA had not entered the war at that time, and the New York Times published an account of the loss of the Lancaster. Pearl Harbor was bombed by the Japanese on the 7th of December 1941. Some estimates say that about 6,000 people died out of a ship's complement of about 9,000. Others put the figure that the loss of just over 4,000 people out of a ship's complement of about 6,000. If the higher figures is taken, then this was the worst shipping loss ever, at about four hours worse than the Titanic. After the war, Sir Vincent Churchill was asked why he had not lifted the injunction on the loss of the Lancaster. He replied, I forgot to do that. We will only get a better estimate of the loss in 2040 when the injunction is lifted. The BBC would like to make a document during the loss before the remaining survivors die, but they will not break the injunction. Very few press reports have appeared in the UK press. The Daily Telegraph published a full paragraph press on Tuesday, the 17th of June, 1980. As a result of the Daily Telegraph's press, the HM Lancaster Survivors Association was formed in 1981. In 1985, the second pilgrimage took place when the coach was hired, when one coach was hired. In 1980, two coaches were hired for the fourth pilgrimage and a new memorial was unveiled. In 1990, during the fifth pilgrimage, the memorial was repositioned. The sixth pilgrimage was organized by the British, by the Royal British Legion. In June 2000, the 60th anniversary of the loss was attended by 24 survivors and many others. This was a big occasion and all were put up in two hotels. It is not expected that such a large turnout will happen again. Here are some of the survivors who attended a pilgrimage on the 12th of June 2000. Very brave man. This is the memorial at Saint Nazar in memory of the sinking of the gas sprayer. Conclusions. If the loss of life and the sinking of the Lancaster were about 6,000, this, this was probably the worst maritime disaster. The finger of blame for such a large loss of life can only be pointed at the officer who took the decision to topple the vessel. However, in its defense, the British forces were treating fast in unprecedented numbers and we were at war. Only when the injunction is lifted will the world obtain a better idea of the number who perished. After the Second World War, Sir Winston Churchill said, It is better to jaw jaw than to war war. References With thanks to Brian James Scrabb in 2002 published The Forgotten Tragedy. There's the ISBN number if you want to buy that book. The official website of HMT Lancaster Survivors Association.